Well, hi everybody and welcome back to the channel. I thought today I would give you an overview of my instrument panel. Over the years of building this airplane, I've had a number of questions on the panel and the autopilot installation. And probably everything I'm going to tell you today, you could already find in some of the previous videos I've made. But I thought it'd be nice to have one video where I can go through the whole panel and autopilot installation and just give you an overview. And hopefully that will help you maybe lay out the design of your panel or help you choose what avionics you want to install in your airplane. Well, we'll start off with just a general overview of the whole panel. It's obvious I have two Dynon 7-inch HDX screens on the panel. I have a Garmin 175 IFR GPS on the top. And then going down through the middle is the Dynon radio. And we have two control panels for the autopilot. Obviously the mixture. And if you can see it below the mixture is the intercom. On the left side of the panel, we have a throttle. We have flap switches, or a flap switch. We have the trim, and then we have a, a rotary knob here, which is nice. It's, it's for the dimming of the screens. And what I really like about this switch is when I want to dim the screens, it's quick and easy to do. I don't have to go through menus in here. Above the first dyne on here, I have an autopilot disconnect switch, and there's a little port here. It's a USB for updating the dyne on screens. On the right side of the panel is the uh, e ELT control panel and then over here we have cabin heat some circuit breakers on the right side and then on the left side here below the dynon we have our switches now this panel itself is not the original panel that comes with the zenith kit and again you could go back on previous videos and look but what I did was I took the original panel and I, I left about a one inch lip all the way around and then I cut out the hole and the whole center of that panel. And then the, the new panel is just screwed to that sub panel. And you can see some screws along here and on the bottom there's rivets that hold it together. You still do need to use that sub panel because it has the tabs that get riveted to the glare shield. So the sub panel is in there but it's almost all cut out and I have a new panel on top of that. Now this panel I designed the panel. I designed every switch location and where I wanted everything. And then what I did once I came up with that plan is I worked with Aircraft Specialty to have the panel uh, laser cut out. Or I'm not sure if it's laser cut out or water cut out, but either way, it's, it's professionally cut out by them. Now when you work with Aircraft Specialty to have a panel made, the first step is for you to send them a drawing of your layout. Now your drawing doesn't have to be to scale, it doesn't have to be perfect, but what they do is they take your idea of where you want everything, they put it in a computer, and obviously the computer program centers everything and lines everything up perfectly. Once they uh, do that, they will cut it out of a piece of plexiglass like this, and they just, they mail this to you to just to verify the fit of the instruments and you can verify the fit of the panel in your airplane. And of course, you know, everything fits perfect because they have the CAD dimensions for all of the instruments. But once you go ahead and give them the final okay that everything fits, they'll cut it out of aluminum. And if you choose to, you can have them powder coat it and then silk screen the labels. On my panel, I wanted it painted the same exact green as the inside of the airplane. So I had them send the blank aluminum back to me. I painted it green and then I shipped it back to them and then they silk screened all of the labels on the panel. Now, I think what the, the real advantage of working with uh, aircraft specialty and having your panel professionally cut is you can see things like this, like these complex cutouts. You can certainly do this by yourself, uh, but it's harder to do. But what I really like is all of the holes for the nut plates are already pre-drilled. That is very, very helpful. You don't have to worry about trying to line them up. Everything is just done. When you get your panel back, all you need to do is take your nut plates, and these nut plates come with the Dynon system, so you'll have all the proper nut plates. You just rivet them on, put your instrument in, and put the screws in. It's just super easy to do. Now, I did choose a Dynon panel over Garmin because, I, in my opinion, I think Dynon's a much superior product. 
Uh, even their packaging is, is pretty amazing. I've talked about that before. But what I really like about the Dynon, this is the third airplane that I've installed the, the Dynon system in. And one of the things I really love about it is just how easy it is to wire and connect everything together. All of these, the screens and all of these components have pre-made cables that literally just plug into each other. There's no wiring you have to do. They just, it's plug and play. Now there is some other additional wiring you'll have to do to, to wire up the, the, you know, the actual, this is just a radio head, but the actual radio is in the back of the airplane. So some of that stuff you do have to wire, but all of these components are just super easy to connect together. And it makes a really nice, easy to install system. When I installed this Dynon panel, Dynon did not have, and they still might not have, I'm not sure, a IFR certified GPS. This panel does have a GPS. It has its own GPS antenna on the airplane, and you can see this entire right screen here is the map. So this has its own GPS, which you can fly VFR. You can type in flight plans and do whatever you want. But I built this airplane to be able to fly IFR because I figured... With a bush plane, if I'm traveling far to get out to the back country and I'm stuck at some airport because there's a thousand foot overcast or something like that, it might be nice just to punch up through the clouds. So I installed the Garmin 175. There is a component that you can get from Dynon that connects these two together and it's very, very easy to do. And if you can see on the screen here, you can select what source you want to use for navigation. So right here it says sky view. If I just hit that, you notice it says Garmin. So now with the Garmin, this is using the Garmin GPS information. And if I have an approach selected here, like an LPV approach, the needles and everything that are to follow and the guidance is now on the Dynon screen. So it, it's really nice. They work together very nicely. And this allows me to fly an LPV approach, which has 200 foot minimums, the same as an ILS. So I should be able to get in pretty much anywhere I want. Uh, with this system and if you just want to go back to VFR navigation or whatever you can just hit that again or hit it twice and it goes back to sky view and it tells you which GPS it's using right now you'll notice on the screen it says database no longer current uh, you do have to up the update these every time they come out with a an update and because this airplane isn't flying right now I just haven't updated it so if you hit accept that note will go away but if you're going to fly like that, just be aware that your database isn't current. So there could be towers out there that it doesn't know about and won't display. All right, so that's the Dynon kind of system on the panel here. Now, for the rest of the panel, we'll kind of go through from left to right. I do have, obviously, the throttle on the left-hand side because the stick is in the center. So your right hand is on the stick, your left hand is on the throttle. And this is a throttle that I had that I originally, or I installed, installed in my cruiser, and I didn't like it in there, and then took it out and put the original one back in the cruiser, and I installed that one in here. And this one is the one where you push the button to move it, and you can also rotate it for very fine adjustments. And what's interesting is, I installed this in the, the cruiser because I thought I would like it better, but the way my hand fit on here it was kind of too hard to push the button and move it at the same time. And not, not hard, but what I meant was your hand is kind of at, at the wrong angle in the cruiser to, to kind of push the button and move the throttle. But the seats in the Super Duty are a lot higher, and I find it very comfortable to just put my hand on here and move it. So I put this throttle back in the Super Duty. To the right of the throttle, I have my my flaps and to above the flaps is a trim. Now this is the exact same setup right here that I did in my cruiser. And the reason it's configured like this is because it allows me to move the throttle, move the flap switch with my thumb or move the trim with my finger. I can kind of reach everything all at once. So if I'm doing a go around or something like that, I can give it power. I can start in, er, um, raising the flaps and then I can start trimming it also. So that's the configuration here. Now you'll notice this flap switch isn't just a regular switch like this. This is from Aircraft Specialty. It's all machined out of aluminum. And I did put this yellow and black tape on here just to make it look cool. <laughs> but it comes with this nice gray handle and then this back plate and it comes with a switch that goes in here. What I really like about this is it's, it gives you a much bigger 
flap switch than just trying to actuate a little switch like this. It's a really nice high quality flap handle. I can't imagine ever building another airplane and not using this unless it had manual flaps, of course, but in the Zenith, this is perfect. If you wanted to get one of these, you can go to kitplaneenthusiast.com and we do sell them on the website and they're manufactured by Aircraft Specialty, which is the same company that makes the panel. And as we'll talk about probably on another video, the same company that makes all of the uh, braided hoses for this airplane, for the brake lines and the oil and fuel. If I didn't mention already above the, uh, the trim, I have a dimmer switch for the Dynon. That's pretty nice to have. Above the first screen here, there's an autopilot disconnect switch. So if I panic, I can just hit that and it disconnects the autopilot. There's also a switch down here for the servos. This turns the servos on or off. So if something weird happens, I can hit the autopilot disconnect. But again, if something happens and this doesn't fix the problem, you can just turn the servos off with a switch. To the left of the autopilot disconnect button is a USB port, and that is used to update the Dynons. We talked about the Garmin GPS. The, on the right side here is just a little control panel for the ELT. And then coming around here, we have the push-pull for the cabin heat. And this is just circuit breakers along the bottom there, nothing too fancy. Now, if we look at the switches I have here going from left to right, this is the master switch. So the, it's a three position switch. So the first position up is the battery and then going up again, turns on the, uh, the alternator. And if you, I don't know if you can see it in the camera, but the light flashing down here, that just tells me the alternator is offline right now. To the right of that is the beacon. And then to the right of that is the nav and then strobes. And then we have the recognition lights. This also is a three position switch. So if I go one click up or one switch up, both of the lights on the leading edge come on at the same time and they just, they're steady and solid. If I go up one more, they wigwag left and right. So just, if I'm in the pattern, I'll probably have it on wigwag. Otherwise I might just leave them on recognition. That might help for landing or just uh, visibility in flight. Now, one of the other things you'll notice here, if I move my nav light switch on, you'll notice that the trim switch dims, or the twim, trim light, the LED light here dims. So you can see it dim. If I turn the navs off, it's bright. The reason it's wired like that, and the, uh, the instructions for the trim tell you how to wire that, but this, this little green light may not look like it in the video, but it is super bright. Like, it's annoyingly bright. Maybe in the daylight, at full daylight, it's not as noticeable. But I have it wired to the nav switch because if I'm flying at night, I certainly don't want this that bright. And if I'm flying at night, the nav lights are going to be on. So if I turn the navs on, it dims that light to a reasonable level. I think it's kind of a neat little system they have. Now, I did mention that I have an autopilot in this airplane. And these are the two control panels for the autopilot. This one just lets you spin the heading around. This one lets you set the altitude. And this sets your uh, altimeter setting. And then this is the control panel for the autopilot. I won't get too much into this, or I won't get into this at all right now, because I'll probably make a flying video eventually showing how that works. But just know that that is the control panel for the autopilot. Now, without getting into a actual servo installation video, I'll just kind of quickly show you how I have the autopilot servos installed. That is a backing plate right there from Dynon for the servo mount. And if I can figure out how to get in here with two hands, you can see the servo right there. There's a servo arm. It comes over and it connects to the aileron torque tube or push rod. And that just is what moves it left and right. Now I did have to have that part right there custom machined to fit around the uh, tube and mount it. But that is where the aileron servo is mounted. Now this is a little bit hard for me to get to and film, but the elevator servo is mounted. Anybody building a Zenith knows this is called the hell hole on the bottom of the airplane because it's a relatively small hole that sometimes you need to fit your whole body in. But you can see we have elevator cables and uh, rudder cables. Yes, that is not safety wired yet because I just had to tighten them. But the, if I could put my phone up here, we have the elevator servo back behind the hell hole. And what I did was I made a stiffener for the floor um, and then I uh, 
used a Dynon servo mount on there. And that has a cap stand. You can see that round drum on the servo that has cables that come off and attach to the elevator cable fore and aft. And that just rotates and moves the elevator up and down. Well, hopefully after watching this video, it answered all of your questions about my instrument panel and where I laid out my servos for the autopilot installation. But more importantly, hopefully it gave you some ideas on your instrument panel. This might give you ideas on what you want to do or what you don't want to do on your panel, and that's all fine. So I'm going to continue working on getting this airplane closer and closer to its first flight. Before you go, I encourage you to visit kitplaneenthusiast.com where you can find the uh, switch handle from Aircraft Specialty, as well as seats for the uh, high wing Zenus. We have fairing kits available, hose kits for the uh, fuel and oil and brake lines, just all kinds of good stuff on there. Nice placards you can get for the doors and the rest of your airplane. I really appreciate your guys' support on that website because any little commission that I get from that website helps me do this.